All right, welcome everyone to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do is talk with webmasters and publishers like uh, the ones here in the Hangout and the ones that submitted a bunch of questions already. Um, as always, I'd like to give those of you who are kind of new to these Hangouts a chance to, to ask a first question, if there's anything on your mind right away. If not, that's fine, too. A um, bunch of questions were submitted uh, via the, the Google Plus post. So I'll mostly run through those. And if there are more things that pop up along the way, uh, feel free to, to jump on in and let me know. All right. Um, let's see. Let's start here. I have a client that appears to have a huge drop in organic traffic after the Rank Brain update. Uh, using some tool says there's a 99% probability that this is the cause. Is there such a thing as a rank brain, rank brain penalty uh, like Panda or Penguin? What factors would lead to such a penalty or drop? Does mobile usability play a role? Uh, what else could we be looking at? So rank brain is essentially a system we use to better understand the query and make sure that we're able to match content that we have in our index better to a user's query. So that's not something where a site would just like disappear in the rankings uh, unless it was really ranking for really weird long user queries uh, that were being, for the most part, uh, misinterpreted. So we're kind of accidentally showing your site. So I suspect what you're seeing here is just a normal change in, in the way our algorithms are looking at your site, maybe a change in how our quality algorithms are looking at your site, or the, the core ranking relevance type, type algorithms that are looking across your site. So if you're seeing a really strong drop on any specific day with regards to, to ranking, I'd recommend going through kind of the, the usual steps to, to figure out what might be happening here, to kind of figure out, is it a technical issue? Is it something that you were doing on your site that was technically incorrect? Is it something where perhaps we were showing your site incorrectly in the search results and that, that got improved? Uh, that's something you could look at uh, by looking at the queries you, you were showing your site for before and seeing how those have evolved over time to kind of see were we showing the right URLs for the right queries, or did we essentially improve the targeting of your pages to, to be ranking for more relevant queries? That might be like a lower number of absolute queries, but it might be more relevant, more targeted queries that you're looking at. So those are kind of the, the two main things I'd look at as a first step. And I definitely take an opportunity to, to go go to the Webmaster Help Forums, for example, or try to talk with other uh, Webmaster peers and kind of discuss your site, discuss the issues that you're seeing, the ranking changes that you've been seeing, the URLs where you've been seeing those changes uh, so that other people can take a look at it and give you a bit more advice on what you could be focusing on. Uh, so just in general, looking at this question, there is no such thing as a rank brain penalty that your site might have run into. I assume it's just really just a normal ranking change that has happened. Um, I have a question about duplicate content across different channels. We're a footwear company that sells on our website and other channels like eBay and Amazon. Uh, the title images and product description are identical for hundreds of products. Uh, what are the implications of having identical content on two channels like this? Uh, can this negatively impact our website going up against a trusted site like eBay? Um, so it's hard to say whether or not that will negatively impact your website, but essentially you are putting out the same or similar content across various channels, and you're kind of competing with yourself in, in a case like that. In some cases, it doesn't really matter so much, uh, where if someone buys from your, your business and they go through this site or that site, in the end, essentially, they buy from your business, right? So it's not so much the, the channel that matters that much. If, if it is a matter of the channel and you really want to make sure that people are going through your website, then you might want to reconsider that and figure out a way that you can really focus 
your primary attention on your website and make sure that's the place where people will go for your content and um, maybe reconsider how you interact with other channels that also show the same content. Ultimately, that's more of a marketing question than an SEO or a webmaster question, um, but there, there are always multiple ways to kind of tackle this kind of a problem. I know you said Google doesn't use social media for ranking, but what about social media? Uh, do they pass any page rank? Uh, so most of these, these services that were listed there, as far as I can tell, use no follow on their links, so they wouldn't pass any page rank. So in, in that regard, uh, that's not something that we use for, for ranking. Unless you ended up on Twitter's blog and it was do follow, then it would pass page rank. On Twitter's blog, I, I'm just I guess it's kind of hard. Though. I'm just saying, giving an example. I'm not giving any hints or anything like that. I'm saying unless something went, happened or, or. Well, I mean, if someone discovers your content on social media and republishes it and links to your content that way, then of course, that's uh, that's a, a different situation. Okay. Um, I have a new sitemap for a subdirectory. Does it matter if I tell Search Console the file is in the root of the subdirectory or in the root of the entire domain? Also, how long does it usually take for Google to crawl it? It's been a few days now, and I thought Google was faster. Um, if you have a sitemap file and it's in a subdirectory, then by default, that sitemap file would only be valid for URLs that are in that subdirectory as well. Uh, so that's one thing to kind of watch out for. But past that, it's kind of irrelevant where you place your sitemap file. Uh, if you submit that in Search Console directly, then you'll see the status of the submission. You'll see if it's being processed. You'll see how many of those URLs are being indexed. And the index status in Search Console are pretty up to date. I believe they're updated every day. Uh, so that's something that you'd be seeing very quickly in Search Console when those URLs are being indexed. One thing to watch out for there is Search Console tracks those exact URLs as you have them listed in your sitemap file. Uh, so if we're indexing slight variations of those URLs instead of those exact ones, then we won't count out that as being indexed in Search Console. So for example, dub, 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 non dub, dub, dub in the host name, a trailing slash, uh, upper or lower case in the URL. All of that would, from our point of view, mean that these are different URLs. And if we index a different one rather than the one you have in your sitemap file, we won't count that. And in general, that's less of a problem, but it does make tracking a bit uh, trickier. So as much as possible, if you want to track it like that, I'd recommend being as consistent as you can within your website. That means uh, setting up rel canonical to the exact URL, as you have it in the sitemap file, uh, making sure the internal linking is set up so that it really goes to the exact URL as you have in your sitemap. And essentially, those are the main things to kind of watch out for there. Uh, John, regarding uh, sitemaps uh, and uh, canonical tags, uh, I know I asked you on Twitter regarding whether if you have CDN, uh, based images, whether it's useful to use a real canonical to point to the main domain images. And you said that doesn't really have any effect, at least from Google's point of view. Uh, what about if I include the CDN URLs for the images in the sitemap? Would it show in Search Console as being um, you know, indexed if Google actually indexes the CDN URLs for the sitemaps, even if, if it's not on the My Property? Uh, that should happen, yes. I, I'm not 100% sure if you need to verify the CDN. So if you add the CDN to your Search Console account, that, that's uh, definitely good practice, because then you also see error information for that CDN. Um, so that's one thing I'd recommend doing there. I think even without having it verified, you'll see uh, the kind of the counter if these URLs are being indexed or not. No, OK, thanks. If I could interrupt really quick, one, we actually tried this recently, and uh, we were planning to move all of our uh, sitemaps off to a CD and sort of host them in like this, like an Amazon S3 or Couchbase, whatever. <clears throat> and that was where the actual sitemaps were going to reside. And one of the ways we were only able to see 
uh, errors and whatnot for those things was to have um, the CDN verified within Google Search Console. Um, that basically left anybody doing like SEO work at many of our properties uh, unable to look at like the old versions of their sitemaps. So like any errors that they may have like normally been looking at, if they all got moved uh, to the CDN like for hosting, then you couldn't actually see all the errors there. Um, we've kind of pulled back and we're trying to put things back where they were so that we can have, you know, individual um, stats and errors and, and stuff. For, we're, we've got like over 120 sites, like news sites that we're working okay. with. So um, trying to put them back in place. Uh, anyway, one of the questions that I think is still lingering and that I just kind of wrote in the chat on the side there is um, whether or not we can use sort of like a, well, this like an like a sitemap HTTP handler that would send requests for a sitemap. So if it's at domain.com slash sitemap.xml, can we just use that handler to send them to the actual XML sitemaps that we're building continually out on, like S3 or something like that? Is that a legitimate thing to do? I don't. So if you're redirecting to the sitemap URLs, I'm not 100% sure. If you, yeah. if you can proxy those sitemap files, that would definitely work. OK. That, that might be an option, depending on, on the type of setup that you have. Yeah. I think uh, it sounds like we just have limited access or no access to the root of our domains. And a different, couple different conversations that I've had with Google and different reps there have said, you guys really need to, like, you should put them at your root. <laughs> and so like, actually getting them, there is proving, getting, getting them there is proving difficult for us, uh, for yeah. all of our properties. So, so I guess for search, it would work if you put them on a CDN or if you kept them on a CDN. But like, like you said, you'd need to have that CDN verified so that you can get the, the statistics for the sitemap right. files. Yeah. Sometimes that's, that's important. Sometimes that's less important. Like if you have one group that focuses on the sitemap files, maybe they're the ones that look at the statistics and they just have it, both of those verified. Whereas a normal yeah. kind of like uh, domain owner uh, essentially doesn't need to worry about the sitemaps indexing. Yeah, the, the whole process started because our current sitemaps got so large in size from years and years of news content being published daily that uh, <laughs> the, the SQL commands that are running in the background to build those um, pages just time out essentially. So we're continually getting errors from Google saying, hey, we can't see these anymore. Uh, for our news sitemaps, it's not so difficult because we're sort of clearing them out every 20 or 48 hours. Yeah. Re-upping, whatever. Yeah. All right. Somewhat helpful. That's sometimes tricky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, for WordPress, I know, for example, with the Yoast SEO plugin that automatically generates a sitemap. Uh, the sitemap. So if you access domain.com/sitemap.xml, it redirects you to sitemap underscore index .xml. But uh, Search Console seems to take the uh, first version with with no problem, so it does detect the redirect. I don't know if it would also detect the redirect between two domains, but it does on a, you know from sitemap to sitemap underscore index. You can add the without the underscore index, and it would take it. With, yeah, that's uh, interesting. I may just I may just have to give it a shot and try it out maybe on one property and see what happens. We'll test it out. Thanks. Yeah. Cool idea. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, here we go. I have a question about content syndication, like a blog, which we already published on our site uh, that got indexed in Google. If we republish that content in another platform, like Medium, LinkedIn, et cetera, will that be duplicate content? And will we get punished for this act? Um, so this is kind of similar to, to the previous one question about uh, republishing um, kind of the products across different channels. Uh, in this case as well, you'd essentially be competing against yourself across all of these different platforms. Um, it's not that we would punish a website for doing that. There is no penalty for, for having this kind of duplicate content across multiple channels. Uh, so if you think that you can attract different users across those different channels, then maybe go for it. But uh, I just keep in mind that this can result in one of these other channels ranking above your website uh, just because we think that overall, maybe your content published on LinkedIn or on Medium or wherever uh, is, uh, 
perhaps more relevant to a user that's searching at the moment. So it's not so much that we would penalize a website for doing this, but you just have to keep in mind that uh, from a ranking point of view, we might be showing one of these other variations first. Uh, we've agreed to let a partner publish some of our material on his website using a canonical tag and a nofollow on any links uh, in the full article. Will the canonical tag be treated as a link and pass page rank? Uh, so another variation of content publishing across different channels, I guess. Uh, the canonical tag isn't the link, so we wouldn't really see that as a link that we'd be forwarding. Uh, but we would try to collect the signals that these individual pages are collecting and forward those on to the preferred canonical so that we can take this kind of set of individual pages and treat it as one URL. So it's not so much that we would treat it as a link, but it might work in similar ways to combine the signals that we have. I have a great page on my site that attracts lots of natural links, uh, but there's a lack of people that want to go there explicitly to that page. Uh, do I risk being hit by quality algorithms when I have a page with lots of links but few visitors that want to go to that specific page? So this sounds like a weird situation. If you have a page on your site that attracts lots of links but nobody actually goes there, what are those links kind of coming for and where are they really coming from? So that's, I, I guess, just an aside from, from my point of view to kind of keep in mind and think about what's actually happening there, uh, if, especially if someone else is doing link building for your site and nobody is actually going to those links, then that doesn't sound like a, a really natural situation. Uh, from our point of view, we wouldn't be looking at who goes to those links, though. So it's not that search would say, well, this is a bad thing. We'll, we'll kind of ignore that. Uh, but from a general website point of view, if nobody is going to your site, then you're going to have a hard time converting people uh, into customers, right? So that's something that I would definitely look into and think about what what it is that your pages are doing wrong or that they could be doing differently so that people actually do follow those links and go to your website rather than just blindly link to that. Uh, does Google track if users are coming to a specific page uh, from search and convert there? Uh, like if users uh, find what they're searching for, uh, does that improve the rankings of a page? Uh, no, we don't use things like Google Analytics when it comes to search, so we wouldn't know when people are actually converting. Uh, does Google see if a user bookmarks my site and takes that into quality calculation, or is it more like he likes my site and bookmarks that he might also recommend it to other people and use it again? Uh, yes, this is probably more an indirect aspect in that if people like your site, then they'll tend to recommend it to other people, and that's something that we might be able to pick up on. Uh, some of our products can be seen via different URLs, so example.com slash product and example.com slash category slash example. Uh, I'm thinking about getting only the more visible ones or valuable ones and implementing a 301 redirect uh, on duplicate products. Is this the correct way to do it? Sure, you can do that. Uh, you could also use a rel canonical on those pages. It depends a bit on what you're trying to achieve there. If you're really trying to combine all of these pages into one kind of like physical URL that people can go to, then a 301 redirect is probably a good approach. On the other hand, if you need to keep those separate pages within your site because maybe this one product is in multiple categories within your shop or you just for other reasons have that one product listed multiple times on your website, then a rel canonical would be the right tool here because then you could leave those URLs as they are and just say, well, this is my preferred URL. So users could still go to the other URLs to see that content. Uh, they wouldn't kind of lose the, their breadcrumbs when they're navigating through your website. Uh, but you'd still have one URL that we can use to concentrate essentially all of our signals on and to use for ranking. Uh, John, regarding that, uh, you mentioned breadcrumbs. So what's, what happens when a product is accessible from multiple URLs, uh, from multiple categories, let's say? So each uh, one of these URLs will have different breadcrumbs. 
and the raw canonical, I don't know, would be to a product page with no breadcrumbs. Does that mean that Google won't, uh, you know, show any breadcrumbs in the search results? Which probably, is yeah, probably. So we try to focus on the canonical page and use that one to extract the structured data from. Uh, so if there's no structured data markup on the canonical page, but there is on the non-canonical pages, then that's something that you could probably improve. Right. So maybe set a default breadcrumb or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Barry, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, Barry has an AMP question. I, I didn't want to barge in. I figured out a way for you to open it up. All right. Um, go for it. Oh, nice. OK, so I don't know if you saw my blog post. There was basically a few people that I've seen, especially a lot more in the back channels, saying they're seeing a massive surge in AMP traffic, uh, specifically from the in the news carousel with the structure markup and so forth. Um, some are saying it might have been a bug. Some are saying it just might be an algorithm change. Google PR specifically told me it wasn't an algorithm change with the in the news section. Um, I think I don't know if they know if they know or not. But was it, do you know of anything? Was there a bug or something that you saw? I saw you saw the the, the analytics I posted, uh, or was it just like a fluke where I ranked number one in the news carousel? I or you don't know. I don't know. So. Uh, I, I know that the AMP team is, is working on expanding things, as we did the blog post, what was that, maybe a month ago? Um, so that's something where there might be experiments that are running. Those, those kind of experiments kind of run off and on anyway. Uh, but I don't know what specifically you might have been seeing there. So that's something where it probably would have been interesting to see which queries you're looking at. Uh, so I, I can tell you, it was specifically people going to Google on their mobile phone, searching for Google. And then the, in the carousel thing had two articles on Friday and one article on Monday that was there for a few minutes or for 20 minutes or something. That sounds like a good way to get traffic, yeah. But it happens a lot, but I've never seen 7,000 unique visitors' real-time data from it. Google, what's the grid? 500, so 500. your site lower? No, no, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I just want to know, some people are saying it's a bug with analytics. Because I don't see the same data in Search Console. When you filter by Search Analytics and you go to the Search Appearance and you filter by AMP um, in the filter, it has no, no spike. And I have the data. The data is on the 16th and the 17th and whatever. It's there in Search Console analytics. But it's not matching that spike at all. Like the spike is from, let's say, 100 unique visits, um, like clicks to my site um, in search analytics. But you'll see like you know, 7,000 in analytics from AMP, specifically AMP URLs. So that's my question. Why is the search analytics not even close to what's showing in Google Analytics? So you're not aware of any bug or anything? I, I really don't know. I, I'd have to kind of figure out with the AMP team what, what specifically is happening there. But if you're ranking for something, a, a query like Google, then I would expect that you end up with a ton of traffic for something like that. I, I agree. The only thing is, again, why is search analytics not showing it? You'll see, you'll look into it. OK, all right. You have the blog post. It has all those details. OK. Thank you. I'll look into that. Uh, we found thousands of index spam URLs on Google, all advertising fake tech support numbers. How can we report them to Google in bulk instead of one by one? Uh, one way you could do that is to just uh, send me a note on Google+. You can send me a private note there directly, and I can forward that to the team. Um, to some extent, I don't know what we can do there immediately. But uh, if you want to report something that's like a bigger spam report, uh, kind of a more complicated spam report, then that's something you can always send my way. Uh, my web host informs me that Google has sent them a phishing alert for my website for various logged in user only pages uh, where non logged in users are redirected to a login page. Uh, the site and the server are clean. Uh, Search Console doesn't report any problems either. Where can I get further assistance to clarify the problem? Uh, so this is something I'd probably go to the Webmaster Help Forum and post some of the URLs there so that people can take a quick look and escalate that 
uh, if appropriate. Uh, if, if you're really looking at these URLs and you don't see any phishing alert anymore in the browser, then it might also be that this is resolved in the meantime. Uh, with phishing, it's sometimes pretty tricky uh, because some of these phishing pages are blocked by the server. They're behind robots text. Um, maybe they're, they're even cloaking to search engines, cloaking to users that are going there directly. Some of these phishing pages are really only live for people, for example, that click in uh, through a link that, that was posted on email somewhere. So sometimes finding the phishing pages or figuring out what exactly went wrong can be a bit tricky. Uh, so I try to get some help on that if you can't find where it might be coming from. Uh, if you have two internal links with different anchor texts on the same page going to the same URL, how does Google treat this? Are both counted or only the first one it finds? Uh, so we would generally see this as one link from one page. So for links, we look at uh, the page that's linking from, the canonical page, and the canonical page that it's linking to. And we kind of see that link as being a connection between those two. So in this case, we would see that as one link there. Uh, with regards to the anchor text, that's sometimes a tricky question, uh, where also sometimes our algorithms are updated over time to kind of handle that in, in better, uh, more optimal ways. So I wouldn't, in general, worry too much about the anchor text shown there. We generally work right to, to get that collected properly. Uh, the structured data testing tool has been giving us some faulty information. It shows each item twice. And in the actual source code, I can only find the markup once. Uh, furthermore, there is an unspecified type out of nowhere. Um, what should we do? Um, this is something I'd probably post in the Webmaster Help Forum as well, because uh, there are some people that are active there who are really good with structured data who can figure out if this is a problem more on your pages or if this is a more of a problem in our tools. And they can help get that escalated properly uh, to us directly. So that's what I'd recommend doing there. Uh, how do you treat ranking of YouTube videos in normal search results? Do you look at the quality of overall YouTube domain or the quality of specific users and their videos to rank them? Uh, so I guess there, there are two aspects here. On the one hand, uh, we do show a kind of a video universal result where we have a, a block with videos. And the ranking within that block is more handled I guess, on the video search side rather than on the web search side. But we can also show YouTube videos ranking normally in web search, just like we can show any other web page ranking in normal web search. So for the normal YouTube web page ranking in web search, that's essentially normal web, web search ranking. Uh, that uses a, a lot of factors to kind of figure out how we should be showing these. Uh, for the, the video kind of universal experience, that's a bit trickier. And that's more based on video search and not something that uh, I, I believe we've gone into much detail on. Uh, would you say that you consider domain content overall as high quality only when you see users saying it's high quality? Uh, are there any static elements that can make content lower high quality, like keyword stuffing, links from into a page, lack of comments, et cetera? Uh, so with regards to quality, what I'd recommend looking at is that older blog post that we did for Panda, which must be maybe 2012 or pretty far back. In the meantime, uh, written by Amit Singhal, I think it's something about 23 questions you can ask yourself for uh, quality of your content. And I'd recommend going through those questions there, finding out which ones are kind of relevant for your site, and then having someone who's neutral to your, towards your website kind of go through and answer those questions. And then maybe also look at other competing sites to, to give you some information on how other sites are doing with regards to those questions. And really trying to get as honest feedback as you can, even if it's sometimes hard to kind of accept or listen to. So this is high quality, I mean, um... Like maybe we should just let everyone know that this doesn't understand because the, the question keeps on popping up for like three and a half years. So high quality, like articles that are written well, that make sense. 
right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's more than just a text, though. And so that's that's one thing I, I keep in mind. And also, one thing that always comes up uh, is people saying, well, my content is unique, therefore it's high quality. And just because the text is unique, the words are kind of unique, doesn't mean that this content is automatically high quality, or that if someone were to go to your website, uh, that they would consider this content as being high quality. So that's something where you kind of need to take a step back and look at your website overall. And don't just look at the text. Don't just uh, double check that the text is actually unique, uh, because sometimes you can like spin the words around and it's actually still readable, but it doesn't make your content high quality just because no one else has that exact combination of words uh, on the web. Engaging content. Engaging is, is, I guess, a good way to put it as well. Um, it's, it's not trivial, and it's really different uh, depending on the type of website. So that's one of those things where we can't give like exact advice and say, you need to put these meta tags on your pages, and then we will consider your page high quality. That's, that's not the way that it would work. Um, let's see. Oh, here's one that Barry will like, Penguin. Um, our site was penalized by Penguin for having spammy backlinks. Uh, since then, we found it very difficult to recover our main keyword, mirrors. Uh, we've managed to get our rankings back for more long-term keywords. However, when it comes to our main keyword, we're still not appearing in the search results. Uh, can you offer some insight on why this might be? Um, really hard to say what, what specifically that might be. Uh, if you're seeing this kind of a disconnect between individual keywords that are leading to your website, that's something I'd probably also go to the Webmaster Help Forum on to kind of get advice from other people with regards to whether or not this is a normal situation or maybe if there's something on your site that could be improved to make it rank more broadly as well. But in general, web spam algorithms or kind of site-wide algorithms uh, like this, they would affect all of the keywords that are kind of leading to your website. It's not that it would like drop in rankings that far across the board, but it would kind of have an effect on, on everything that's leading to your website. Obviously, some things your site will be really relevant for, uh, which might be the more long tail keywords that you're looking here at here, or maybe your brand name. Your site will be really relevant for that, uh, where any kind of a demotion or drop won't be as visible. Uh, for schema.org, which entity do you recommend for an e-commerce website, organization website, clothing store? Uh, does it matter which one I select? No, not really. Uh, can there be more than one? Um, I don't know for sure, but uh, you'd probably want to double check with the, the schema.org markup there. And it goes on uh, for reviews, votes on category pages to which entity should the reviews be related uh, to the website organization as a summary of all product reviews in the category. Uh, so I believe this is one of the, the more common reasons that we see sites kind of mess up with, with their review markup or with their, their aggregate review markup. Uh, it's important that this markup applies to one specific product, your main item on this page. So if you have a category page, you're listing a bunch of different products. Or if you have a price comparison page where you list kind of uh, similar products from different manufacturers with different prices, then those would be different products. Those would be things where you wouldn't be able to use review markup or kind of this aggregate markup on those pages. So when you're looking at the aggregate markup, make sure that you're looking at our guidelines and making sure that you're really applying it to the right type of content, not uh, just blindly to, to any page that you have on your website. Uh, I have a couple of questions about the canonical link tags. Um, are they respected on Google News? How should we be handled on large publications? Uh, wait. 
So are they respected on Google News? I'm not actually 100% sure. I'm pretty certain that we would use them there, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, what you might be able to do specifically for Google News is contact our team directly through the Help Center. There's a contact form there that you can use to, to contact someone from Google News, and they can generally clarify questions like this for you. Um, how should they be handled uh, when large publications create shared global sections that display the same on different websites? Um, so when it comes to web search, uh, if you have this situation where you're republishing the same content on multiple websites, I'd recommend using the rel canonical to pick one of, your, one of those versions as the preferred version. It doesn't have to be the same version for all of your articles. It might be that uh, you kind of distribute them across different websites, maybe depending on the, the kind of local audience that you have on the individual sites, kind of pick one of those as canonical. Uh, but if, if you can, try to use one as a canonical. Uh, the main benefit of this uh, from a web search point of view is that we'll be able to combine all of the signals that these articles collect and focus them on your preferred canonical, making it easier for us to show that one in web search. Uh, John, can I ask one question regarding this canonical? Sure. Uh, actually, in Indian webmaster community, it was a, a hangout. So uh, what the problem was that uh, there were two pages, regard, uh, uh, two, two duplicate pages. One was canonical, and the other one was pointing it as canonical. OK, but if that, that page is interlinked from another pages, which is not the canonical, and it's canonical is some other page, so are the chances that this page will be indexed because it is interlinked? It's possible. Yeah, so, because this was the biggest problem with us, like query parameter site header, and it was indexed. It's it's very possible. So there, there are two aspects uh, to that. On the one hand, we have to index that page so that we can process the canonical header on that page first. So as a first step, when we find a new URL and there's a rel canonical on there. We'll index that page first. Then we'll process the rel canonical, and then we'll try to combine it with your preferred canonical. Uh, that's kind of what, one aspect that might be happening there. The other thing to keep in mind is canonical is, for us, is a signal. It's not a directive saying that you must index only this URL and not these other versions. But uh, for us, it's a signal. And we combine that with other signals that we have with regards to picking the right page to show. So that could be redirects, if there are redirects in, in this kind of set of pages as well, that we can pick that up and use those as a signal as well for the preferred page. Uh, the internal linking also plays a role. The canonical plays a role. Uh, the sitemap file plays a role. All of these uh, kind of get combined. And uh, we, we look at these signals and say, well, we know in this set there are maybe five pages, and this one has a canonical, this one has redirects, uh, this one has all of the internal links, and maybe this other one has a canonical and is in the sitemap and has a lot of internal links. Uh, so we'll pick the one that essentially most of the signals kind of point at. So that's, so that's something that could be happening there, where we just say, well, we're not 100% sure we can trust this canonical. A lot of the other signals still point at this other URL, so we'll just pick that other URL for indexing. Uh, the important, or I guess the good part here, is usually this doesn't matter for a webmaster. Because when we choose a canonical, we just swap out the URL that we show in the search results. The ranking stays the same. If we have two URLs and one is canonical, we'll rank it. Like, like we normally would, if the canonical switches, we will rank it in the same place uh, as we would the other URL. So if, the, if we have the wrong version as canonical, then usually that's not something that, as a webmaster, you really need to worry about. The main place where I would kind of worry about this is if this is across different domain names and you have settings for your domain names, maybe country versions of your domain name, or one of the domains is uh, blocked by no index or blocked in other ways, uh, then obviously if we pick the wrong version, that 
could have an effect on, on the way that the content is ranked. But if it's within the same website and we're picking one URL that's kind of clean or one URL that has a parameter attached to it, then that's not going to change anything with the ranking. Uh, but Jun, uh, suppose uh, in head section there is one page and query parameter it is written head head link or head section that page and that page is pointing to a canonical to its parent page. So in such a scenario, what should I expect that after some time search engine will index the right page as canonical or I have to remove this from header? What it's, is the it's hard to say option. what what the right page would be. So this is is kind of an argument that we we run across with our web search teams from time to time in that uh, we'll see webmasters are saying this is the right page that they would like and uh, the search engineering team is saying well actually the webmaster is choosing the wrong page. So that's that's one argument that's sometimes really hard to say whether or not that's actually the right page. Uh, the other thing, when you, since you mentioned the, the parent page, if the content on these pages is different, then maybe it makes sense for us to ignore that canonical completely. Uh, because if we can tell that these pages are not actually equivalent, then that canonical re relationship doesn't really apply to those pages at all. So if you have like one product page and one category page, you're saying canonical is the, the category page, then from our point of view, if we were to analyze that properly, we should say, well, the webmaster probably made a mistake with the rel canonical. These are not equivalent pages. Therefore, we should igno ignore that rel canonical. I don't know if, if that applies in your case. Mm, that doesn't apply, actually. I was just trying to track how many people are clicking onto this. This is why it was header section. No. So okay. this yeah. is one of those things where um, all of the signals kind of add up. And uh, the better you can tell us this is really the version that you want to have indexed and shown like that, the more likely we'll be able to do that. We can't guarantee it, though. OK, thanks. John, it's interesting if I can jump in really quick. What you said sure. about um, potentially ignoring, you guys are going to potentially ignore the canonical if you see that these two pages, uh, in essence, are different enough from each other. Um, I don't know if you can even speak to it, but I'm curious about what that sort of threshold is. A lot of what we do is uh, we'll create an article, write the whole thing out maybe in a local market about some news event that's happening, and we may pick it up on our national news site. And it'll be copied, essentially, but we may change a date line or add a very small paragraph to the end, but essentially the entire length of this article, including any attached videos, photos, et cetera, are going to be the exact same. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter if you're necessarily ignoring these. We're still putting the canonical in there to point to the original. And so I don't know anything you want to say to that. Usually, we, we should be picking that up properly. So. What, what happens in, in a case like that is we try to pick out the primary content of, on those pages. Uh, so if, if these are different news websites, for example, then of course the boilerplate, the navigation, the heading, uh, kind of the design will be different across these pages. But we'll try to pick out the primary content and use that for as a basis for kind of any comparisons that we do. Usually the, the non-equivalent problem is more of an issue when sites really implement it incorrectly, um, such as when all of the canonical pages point to the root of the, of the website. That's, that's something that we've seen a lot in the past. Uh, that's something where it's, it's very obvious. The webmaster didn't realize what's, what's happening there, and uh, this is something that we need to ignore. The situation where there are just subtle changes in the text on a page that's usually less of an issue that we, we worry about. Awesome. Great, thanks. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we recently migrated to HTTPS and have seen a massive drop in page views. Some of it uh, we can attribute to new UX and responsive website implementation, which limits clicking on tap targets. Uh, what are your thoughts on possible reasons for drop in page views, specifically for a website's desktop version? Uh, so 
this is a tricky question because it makes it sound like you're just moving to HTTPS. Uh, but especially if you're mentioned there is a new UX, uh, the, the website is now responsive, uh, the click targets are different, that essentially what you've done is redesigned the whole website. Uh, so it's not so much of just like simply switching to HTTPS and then everything should be normal, but essentially you're you're doing a full website redesign and these things usually take a bit more time to be processed because we really have to kind of understand your website new again. So this is something where, depending on what kind of changes you made, you'll probably see some kind of fluctuations uh, during that migration period. One thing I'd recommend doing there is really going through the site move checklist that we've put together in the Help Center and really checking off all of those items to make sure that you're really doing everything right. So if you're changing URLs, make sure you have 301 redirect set up. Uh, if you're changing the, the internal navigation on a website, then make sure that we can still crawl through that navigation. Maybe check with um, a crawler of your own. Uh, Screaming Frog is something that a lot of people use to make sure that the links within your website still work. Um, so these are the kind of things that you'd want to watch out for anytime you do a bigger redesign on a website. And if you add HTTPS to a bigger redesign, then usually the HTTPS part will be the smallest of your worries. Usually, the, the bigger problems are really with the whole rest of the redesign. Uh, but in general, if you're moving to HTTPS, if you're doing a redesign and you know this works a lot better for your users, then this is something that shouldn't have a gigantic impact, and it should settle down reasonably quickly, uh, especially if you've made sure from a technical point of view that things are lined up properly, that you're monitoring uh, the right versions in Search Console as well. Uh, so if you move to HTTPS, then make sure you verify the HTTPS version of your site so that you can also track that in Search Console, for example. Uh, under what circumstances would the cache colon copy of a website and the text-only web page completely differ? Uh, currently, all cache copies of the web site uh, of web pages on my website resemble the 404 page of my website, whereas the text-only version of the same pages are reflected uh, with correct content. Can this be a cause of concern for us? Uh, that does sound a bit problematic. So it's hard to say what specifically is happening there. Uh, if you have a JavaScript framework website, that's something where the cached version will reflect the HTML page that you serve, uh, not specifically the rendered version. So that might be one thing that you're looking at there. Um, if the cached version looks like the 404 page and the text-only version looks like the actual text on a page, it might also be that we're having trouble rendering your pages properly. So using the, the fetch and render tool in Search Console would be something I'd, I'd check out there. Uh, if you can't figure out what exactly is happening there, I'd also send you to the Webmaster Help Forum uh, where people will be generally happy to, to kind of help you kind of narrow things down a bit to figure out what actually is happening there. Uh, again, with regards to JavaScript framework sites, uh, single page apps, those kind of things, I wouldn't use the cached version of a page as a representative of the page itself, uh, because that's not really that suitable for something where the JavaScript needs to be executed in order for the content to be visible. Um, simple question. Oh, simple questions are always the trickiest ones. Uh, would you call a title, so a page title, a direct ranking factor, indirect ranking factor, or just an important element since it's not directly visible to users? Um, I think all of these kind of apply. So we, we would use this uh, in ranking as well. It's not the primary ranking factor of a page, but we do take it into account with regards to ranking. Uh, we also try to show the title in the search results. So if uh, this is something where we think the title is representative of a page, we might show that in the search results, and that would indirectly affect how many people might be clicking through to your site. 
And uh, past that, of course, the title is kept in bookmarks. If people are bookmarking the page, uh, that's something that might make it easier for people to find your page again and click on that directly in your browser. So that's also not a direct ranking factor, but it does kind of affect the traffic that could be coming to your pages. All right. Wow, we just have a few minutes left. Um, and still a bunch of questions. So maybe I'll just open it up for, for more questions from you all directly. And uh, we can see if we can switch some of the questions to one of the next Hangouts. What else? John, how do you feel on? about commenting on uh, algorithm updates that people have been seeing? You, uh, what's your comment on commenting on that? My comment on commenting. Um, <laughs> That, that gets very deep quickly. No, I, I think it's, it's perfectly normal for people to discuss algorithm changes, especially when they're seeing uh, bigger changes in search with their website, with their rankings. I, I think that's totally normal for people to discuss on, on Twitter or wherever else. Um, I, I wouldn't tell people not to do that. Uh, from, from our point of view, we, we don't specifically call out all algorithmic changes that we make, because we make tons of changes all the time. And in a lot of cases, maybe only a handful of sites, well, not a handful of sites, but a, a small subset of the sites or queries would be affected by an algorithm. So it doesn't really make sense to, to call out or announce any specific change. And also, there are a lot of things where we try to improve the relevance of the search results where there's nothing really actionable that we can tell a webmaster. So if we're improving the targeting of a website, uh, how it's ranking in search, uh, so that it's ranking for better key keywords, then they might be seeing a change in the number of impressions or clicks they're seeing. Uh, but hopefully, those will be more targeted. So it's not so much that we would say the webmaster needs to do something to fix this situation. Maybe it's kind of already being fixed. So that's. Those are kind of the reasons why we, we don't really have a, a comment on every kind of change that, that happens in search. Um, I, I think it's awesome that you collect uh, all of these reports in, in search, uh, because it's also sometimes useful for us, where we might roll out a change and think, oh, this is something nobody will really notice. This improves things for searchers. And you come back and say, well, there are tons of people complaining about this change. And we'll take that into account and see, are we doing something wrong? Do we need to tweak something? Do we need to say something more specific so that people understand what's happening here? Uh, those kind of things. Are you guys ever going to create something like google.com slash changes? I'm just, you know, I, where you just I go in the comment. So specifically, with, with all the algorithm changes that we make in search, they're, they're like thousands a year. So it's not, I, I don't think that would be particularly useful. Okay. It would be useful if you saw, like, you know, you, you basically, I got hundreds and hundreds of comments of people saying, yeah, we saw something. You look into it, and you're like, oh, yeah, we did an update, and this is what happened internally. And you'd be like, you know what? We did do something. I'm not going to say any more than that, but we did do something. Well, I, uh, I can say that pretty much every day, right? We what? can do something. Our engineers are not just playing pool all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, we know what I'm talking about. I mean, you, uh, when you say you do something, a lot of the changes have to do with user interface changes or maybe how you define a query. But when it comes to the ranking order of things, or maybe different signals, you change how signals work, or you shorten the code on it, you know, you kind of like clean up code around certain signals and so forth, and that does have an impact. It might be, obviously, it's useful for you guys. If it's useful for you guys, maybe it's also useful for the webmaster community. Yeah, but we, we make tons of those changes all the time. So Yeah, but I only report on them maybe once or twice a month at max. Yeah, but I mean, there, there are also like bigger changes that we make that, that don't end up like that. Uh, like, I so don't, don't know, tell when, when RankBrain launched. I <laughs> covered RankBrain stuff, and you said, oh, six months ago we launched RankBrain and nobody noticed it. And I have like documents of like unconfirmed updates that you guys wouldn't confirm. So I don't know if you could say that for sure. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, you, you notice everything. That's unfair. I don't I could have missed it, but there's no way to know because you guys said nobody noticed it, but. <laughs> Rusty Brick, uh, SEO Law. Is coming soon. 
the search engine track. Anyway, there is a benefit. So obviously, it's up to you guys to decide if you want to comment or not. It's just um, anyway. That's it. Go ahead, well, just be nice if you guys create like you know, just like you do with uh, Coleco Labs. Uh, I don't know even if anybody has been there from here, but uh, that's an amazing stuff that you guys are doing out there. But you know, I just thought it would be the whole webmaster community will all leave you alone with these questions, and everyone can just head to this page. Sure. Well, they used to do every every month or so. Used to come out with a blog post, and used to nobody really cared about it. So. You used to do that like a two years ago or so. You used to say, here's our... Yeah, a couple, couple of years ago. I really like that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. I, I mean, if, if we, we documented all of these, I, I think we'd probably see even more discussions around things that most people don't really need to worry about. Oh, I see. OK. So that's... I mean, obviously, some sites will go up, some sites will go down, and the sites that go up, they don't really say much about what they're seeing there. Uh, sometimes we'll also see changes that we make where lots of people are kind of complaining about things changing. But uh, when you look for details, nobody wants to mention the site. And when you ask the engineers, they're like, oh, we made some web spam changes. Uh, so it's something where lots of people are talking about it. But normal business owners, they shouldn't be negatively affected by that. So that's that's also something that that could be happening. But yeah, I, I mean I totally don't want to suppress the discussions around these changes, but uh, we really can't comment on on a lot of these changes that are happening. Uh, sometimes they're, they're really subtle changes on our side. Sometimes there are things where there is really nothing actionable that a, that a webmaster could do. When, when there's something specific where we can say, well, we recognize that sites are doing this really bad practice, and we're going to start demoting sites for that, then that's something that, that we would be talking about. For example, with the mobile stuff, where we've been doing that with the interstitials. Uh, that's something where we also try to pre-announce it as much as possible so that people don't get surprised and that people can kind of adapt to that over time. and really kind of take this actionable impact, input and turn it into something that does work well in search. Uh, John, can you comment quickly on the 1.75, what is it, almost 1 billion websites that uh, have been removed? Um, so 1 billion websites. Yeah, that you guys removed. I mean, uh, there was this thing going on. I don't know. Oh, oh, I think that's the, the DMCA stuff. Or, well, there's, yeah. There's, In the, so, so all these websites disappeared. So now what? Uh, I mean, what if there were some useful sites in there? What do you guys don't know? I, I, I mean, it's, I, I, I don't know what, what, what 1.7 billion uh, websites were. I, I suspect if it's uh, with regards to the DMCA takedowns, then that would be listed in the transparency report. And you'd have more information there about why they're taking down. And for DMCA takedowns in general, as far as I know, it's on a per page basis. So it's not that we would be taking down websites, but rather individual. Okay, because I mean the headline, the headlines usually Google removed 1.75 billion pages due to copyright. Because Google documents the transparency report, how many pages they removed due to this legal request. Yeah. Yeah. Barry, I think you're, uh, you're into me. Yeah. So um, th that's fine. Yeah, no, I'm just uh, curious, but yeah, I'll check it out. I, I check out the transparency report. I, I find that really fascinating. Also, to, to kind of see what kind of websites are affected and uh, what kind of complaints Google is seeing um, and, and how that process works in general. Is it hard for a DMCA, uh, a site that's been taken down, to come back uh, in terms of like ranking and so on? Or will, will the site ever be able to gain, you know? Well, it's, as, as far as I know, it's, it's on a per page basis. Yeah. And uh, th there's a clear process that you can do to request the takedown and that you as a site owner can do to contest that. So that's, that's something that I, I believe is well-defined 
in, in, the, in the processes that we have available there, which is probably dictated by some laws, but I, I don't know the details of the, the legal situation. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, let's take a break here. Uh, it looks like there are still a bunch of questions that, that were submitted. So uh, feel free to move those to one of the next Hangouts if you'd like to kind of keep those. Um, and I'll try to take those into account uh, for the next one as well. Uh, if you all have, if anyone here has uh, suggestions on how to better kind of keep track of the Q&A and make sure that we're handling the right questions, uh, feel free to, to send me suggestions in, in that regard as well. Uh, I think uh, there's probably a bunch of stuff that we could be doing differently. And with the new layout, it's going to take a bit of time to kind of settle down into uh, something that, that works really well. But uh, I think we're noticing a difference. I mean, it feels like it's almost nothing changed, but it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one good thing. But on the other hand, maybe we should be changing things more. Uh, kind of like with other Google algorithms, maybe it's worth kind of rethinking how we do these office hours hangouts. And if any of you have any suggestions on what we could be doing differently, um, maybe just a monologue by myself talking about uh, the individual algorithm changes that we've made, or <laughs> I don't know, some other voting system for uh, discussing the questions that, that we look at, uh, feel free to let me know. And we'll okay, see. It'll work if you do these uh, algorithm changes, uh, you know, thing else. I, I don't know. Maybe I could just like read the lines of code that change. We changed line 7,500. Um, no, just kidding. Uh, probably won't be able to do that, uh, or at least won't be able to do that twice. So maybe like once, you know. Uh, but I, I kind of like this job. So with that, uh, let's take a break here. Uh, thank you all for your questions, for your feedback, and hopefully I'll see you again in one of the next Hangouts. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Hey, John.